everybody once again it's brand man sean and as you can see yet again i have a very special guest i'm really excited about this one right here because uh she's gonna tell you guys what you need to hear not necessarily what you want to hear um, as being creatives or even just some of the business people in the game but this is atira she is an entertainment ip and business attorney so all of that legal stuff that you guys have a lot of those legal questions you run into about not getting your stuff stolen and a whole lot of other random stuff. She will, she will be able to tell you in spade this is a trustworthy source right here. However, I don't believe, uh, what, what, what do you guys say? You can't take this as legal advice. Don't you guys mm -hmm. have like a... <laughs> it's a disclaimer. It's a disclaimer that this is not a legal consultation. <laughs> there we go. not technically legal advice. There we go. So the brand man interview won't hold up in court. So the tear. <laughs> What, what's good? I'm happy to have you here. I appreciate you, first and foremost. Not a problem. Um, tell everybody, just, well, just how did you get started? Like, did you already know that you wanted to be an entertainment lawyer from the jump, or did you, like, start off on an artist side or something like that? Okay, so interestingly, I've been running around since I was seven years old telling people that I wanted to be a Supreme Court judge. It didn't technically work out that way, as you can see. But um, I always aspired to be, you know, in the law in some way, shape, or form. Um, I switched over to entertainment law while I was in college. I have an undergraduate degree in mass communications from Clark Atlanta University. And it was while I was there that I met so many people that were in radio, TV, film, that were producers, that were just doing a lot when it came to the entertainment world. Um, and specifically, I had a friend who pretty much dropped out in order to uh, do a deal, pretty much. And the deal fell through because he had no idea what he was signing, really. And that pretty much inspired me to get into entertainment law because I realized that I could use my the talents and the aspirations that I already wanted to use, which was, you know, being a, an attorney and make it, one, relatable and also, like, helpful to the people around me because these were already my friends, you know? Mm -hmm. So I really just wanted to figure out how I can help them while doing what I wanted to do in the first place anyway. That, okay, so it was pretty organic for you. What was that first situation like? If you can give any detail on that as far as how you, yeah, why, why did it fall through? Um, it fell, it didn't fall through. He got paid off of it, but he didn't get paid as much as he should have. Okay. So he kind of just burnt through the money and then was like, oh, what am I supposed to do now? And it's like, if you would have known what to negotiate in that contract, you would have been set for life off of that one song oh man it was one of those it was one of those it was like a very um and because the the advance amount was so much you know he got excited but what he wasn't really banking on or what he wasn't really taking into account was the back end which is publishing and royalty and because he didn't get so much on that you know he was kind of left uh i guess you will say running around our campus <laughs> he was one of those stragglers that was just around our campus um just there to be there just because you know he used to go there but he dropped out and then he couldn't get back in because of whatever reason and uh yeah because I, I, I think he pretty much threw away a scholarship Ooh. so yeah it was hard for him to get the scholarship back okay dang all right well like one thing you mentioned uh, was publishing how can you best describe publishing to people because it's a confusing subject for a lot of artists. And I know even sometimes where I hear different people talk about it, sometimes it makes me feel like I'm misinformed. What's your Got perspective? You. So don't feel bad because it took me almost a full year to figure out how this works. But the right. best way that I can describe it is publishing is based off of what, what the physical manifestation of the song and the beat. So that would be the, the actual written lyrics and the actual notes. Like, you know, you can look at a, a musical composition and it has music notes mm -hmm. and you can write a song out and read the music and it's on a physical piece of paper. So publishing is pretty much quantifying that physical thing. Mm. Does that make sense? Almost, almost. <laughs> you're, saying, you're saying it has to be written down it doesn't have to be, but the best way to think about it 
is that it's the physical manifest. It's like how else? How do you quantify a physical manifestation of a digital product? You can't really. It's hard to kind of wrap your head around. So that's why I say the lyrics and the and the notes, and that's the easiest way that I can um, say that that's where that's what they're trying to quantify. Got it. Got it. Words. All right. So when people use portions of that, whatever the proportion of, that's the parts of that's the money that you make. But when people use portions of that physical manifestation, is that right? Correct. Yes. All right. And that Got includes it. the master. So the master, the master use and the composition use are two different things. The master is using the composition. So one of the uses of the composition is the master use. But then there's also other uses like licensing. Like if you want to license your the lyrics to somebody, or if you want to license the beat to somebody, or if you want to license a portion of the song to somebody, you need both the master. You need permission from for both the master use and the composition use, which is the underlying physical thing. Gotcha. Okay. So that brings that makes me think about something that so many artists like always ask me or I just see in comments or I might be at a festival or something. And I, I always hear this question. Artists are so afraid of getting their music stolen, right? But you know, of course, there's some legal legal actions that they can take to do things on the front end. Of course, there's some things they can do on the back end. But a lot of the th things that I might hear somebody like you say, as far as they should do this or that, um, particularly for the front end, a lot of artists say, I don't have enough money or I don't, like, I'm, I'm not making money. So can I just do this whole poor man's put it in the envelope or well, or I put it on YouTube or I put it out first. So now I can take action. It's mine. I hear artists try to take those free routes or yeah, some, some, some less cost effective. What's the actual cost effective way that artists can actually get it done? The most that you can do is put what is called a copyright disclaimer. So like I tell my producers, whenever they're sending out beats, even if they haven't copywritten them, copywritten them the right way, they can put what's called a copyright disclaimer in the, signature of their emails when they're sending these out that pretty much just states hey you know this is my work i created it on such and such day i'm sending it to you for the purpose of maybe you know creating some kind of collaboration but you're not allowed to use it outside of listening to it right now and that's defensible that is defensible because pretty much what happens is you have the right to your in you have the copyright right as soon as you create something so as soon as you create something new or unique in a fixed form or a fixed and tangible form, which is uh, recording it or writing it down or however you can fix it in a tangible form, once you do it, it's yours. It's mm -hmm. just proving that that's the issue. So the copyright is like a, a prima facie way to say that this is mine, that the government recognizes. So without it, you can still have a claim. It's just harder to prove that it's yours. Got you. Okay. And I, I remember hearing you talk about um, when you have copyright forms, let's say you have beats or songs and things of that nature too, how you can put a lot of so songs on one form. You don't have to just do one song at a time, right? That's correct. So um, a lot of people like to do it per project, um, but you don't have to do it per project. I would say just put whatever amount that you have, just make sure that you catalog it properly so that you can remember which, <laughs> you know, which application you put it on and what the name of it is and all of that. But one sound recording application can, there's like an unlimited number of, of MP3s or MP4 formatted uh, things that you can upload to the website underneath that one application. So I can do like 500 of them for like however much it Cost. I, I, is it like fifty dollars? One hundred dollars. Fifty-five bucks. Yeah. All right. I mean, see, for that, to me, it's like not really much of an excuse. Like, if you can't come across fifty dollars to protect your own business. Correct. You know? I agree with you. I agree. <laughs> and um, I mean, you know, people make hundreds and hundreds of beats, so I understand how that can get, you know, annoying. But if you turn it into a habit and just doing it like every couple of months or every, you know, three months, every six months, every nine months, everybody has a different you know, depending on how often you create beats. But um, mm. I would just say come up with a form, a way to do it. And I mean, look, as, as a producer, if you have your LLC and uh, 
you're copywriting your work, you can deduct that in taxes because it's like something that you have to do in order to make money with your business as an LLC providing pr production services. So, I mean, there's a lot of incentive as to why you should be able to or why you should um, do it. Okay. That makes that makes sense. And just what all type of artists do you work with, by the way? Is it just producers, engineers, or is it? No, so I work with mixed media artists. I work with music artists. I work with um, artists that do nothing but painting. I, uh, I work with dancers. I work with influencers. Um, anything that that involves creating your own content, regardless of what it is, I can help you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, got you. And like, so I think the biggest difference that, well, no, I'll just ask you, what's the biggest difference between an entertainment lawyer and some of these other general lawyers or attorneys that we hear out there? Like, it's, it, it's literally just jargon and experience. So an entertainment lawyer, we're, all we're doing really is managing your businesses, which is just like a typical corporate or business attorney. The only thing that's different is the entertainment specific jargon and the entertainment specific, uh, I guess, uh, fractions or the things that we use to calculate percentages. So that's really the only difference between me and, and a corporate attorney. We're doing the same things, which is like forming companies, um, operating agreements, you know, like trademarking your name or your brand name or whatever your company name is. But what makes it different is what we're quantifying and how. Mm, okay. Now, why, when would I come to somebody like you? Uh, do, do I, yeah, do, how do I add somebody like you onto my team? Does it even work like that? Well, what I like to say is you come to me when you have something for me to look at. So that's somebody, you know, is trying to contract you to do something or I'm a transaction, what we call a transactional attorney. So you don't need me until there's a transaction, whether the okay. transaction, whether the transaction is between somebody who wants to transact with you or you want to transact with them. Got it. So it's like, if I'm don't selling. Don't come to me if you're just asking me questions. <laughs> but, if, but come to me if you have something like a specific route for those questions to go to. Like, don't come to me and be like, hey, um, I just want to pick your brain about the industry and how it works. And no, it's not like that. It's more like a, hey, somebody um, presented me with this contract. I don't know what it means. Can you explain it to me? Or, hey, I want to, you know, start a production services company. How do I do that? You know, those are the kind of questions. And that's when you need me. Those are the kind of questions that will help facilitate growth, pretty much. So, to give you an actual problem to solve, first and foremost. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, I like that because you could very easily just waste people's money and say, "All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take this check <laughs> and answer your questions that aren't gonna really get you anywhere." But so, you, but you like to see progress out of your clients. It sounds like. Absolutely. So. All right. Well, to kind of digress a little bit, so you are. I mean, you're young. You're a young black woman. You're you're killing it from like everything that I've heard and the people that I know that have known Aww. you, you know what I mean, which is dope and I admire it. So, like, how did you get to this? And what what was, yeah, what, what, were, what were your struggles being what you are in your space? Because you, one thing that I really liked about you when we met was the fact that how you have your own way of doing things. You don't really submit to the conservative way of even dressing or jargon. Like all of those types of things. How did that even? What made you make that decision in the first place? And then I was born that way. <laughs> you were born. <laughs> I was born this way. No, seriously. Um, I've been a defiant, not not a problem child, but I've been a defiant child from the very beginning. Always right. questioning why things were a certain way because I knew that, you know, if you can do it this way, that means that there's an opposite way, and if there's an opposite way, that means that there's a gray area of ways that we can do this. That's how I've always thought. So. Um, I've also realized that as an individual, people are going to like you or not like you regardless of what you're doing, whether you're doing it exactly how they want you to do it or not doing it any way at all. Somebody's going to have something to say about it. So I figured, hey, I'm just going to do it my way. And either you rock with it or you don't. And if you don't, that's fine. I'll refer you out. It's that simple. <laughs> hey. <laughs> so what did, have you had any like specific situations where they're just memorable, where you felt like because of 
you just choosing to be a little bit more non-traditional or progressive at, um, in your industry that you Absolutely. got to I would say the most pivotal, uh, one of the reasons why I knew I was doing something right was um, I had this artist out of Alabama that one of my engineers introduced me to because he was like, hey, you know, I think he needs an attorney. And um, that's another thing. I just do really good work. I don't advertise really. The most I have is my Instagram. You know, I have a small website and it literally just has my contact information on it. And that's specific. And I did that for a reason. One, I don't like working with people that I don't like. I literally am my own company so that I don't have to work with anybody that I don't like. I did that on purpose. Um, two, all of my clients are word of mouth. It's either, you know, somebody told you that it's something I did for them or I'm in a situation where it becomes relevant and I talk about it and then they're like, I need you. Um, otherwise, I don't want it, to be honest, because, you know, for what? One, I don't know you. I don't know if I'm going to like your stuff unless we develop a relationship. Um, and two, it just makes my life so much easier. <laughs> it makes my life so much easier because, like, my clients are my friends. You know, I support them. I'm a huge music person. I'm a huge just artistic person. I love going to shows. I love exhibits, installments. I love installations. I love, you know, look, that's my thing. I'm always out on the scene regardless of what's going on. So that kind of created its own. It kind of became its own thing out of out of just the fact that I love to do it anyway. Oh, that's dope. But, um, well, go ahead. oh sorry I was just gonna say um, to go yeah. back to where you were talking about I had this one artist out of Alabama that uh, engineer introduced him to me um, but he told me that he already had a meeting with an attorney um, and I asked him who and he told me her name and I was like oh I know her you know go to her I don't want to you know cause any friction she's a really good attorney you know but if you just you know if you decide to go another way hit me up he calls me a couple of days after. Um, I was actually in the studio with him that day. He was in the studio, chopping it up, hanging out. You know, I was like giving them creative input, you know, just being myself. And then um, a couple of days later, he hit me up and was like, hey, you know, if you're still interested in being my attorney, I would really like to work with you. And um, I was like, yeah, definitely. So we had a meeting and the meeting was also at the studio. And he was like, look, I don't know many attorneys that are one, young and black, Two, will pull up to the studio all times of the night if I have a question or I have an issue or anything's going on. He was like, that is almost unheard of. And I really rock with what you're doing. And I really like, he's like, you know, I had nothing against the other attorney, but I just liked you better. I just liked you better. That was it. And I was like, wow. It's like, I literally just have to be myself. And the people who I can help and the people who I can grow with are going to just gravitate towards me. Cause that was, he was already, you know, shooing with this attorney. They already were about to like sign an engagement letter, do everything that they had to do. And he was like, nah, I'm gonna go with the Tara. And he had only just met me that one night because I was there vibing with him, hanging out with him. And he, um, on top of that, he was like, you know, sometimes when these attorneys talk to me, I don't understand what they're saying. He's like, but you find a way to, uh, you find a way to make me understand. And I realized it's just literally because my references are references that you guys understand. I'm a young attorney, so it's like, I'm using movies that y'all watched. I'm using, you know, scenarios that y'all are familiar with from TV shows and from whatever, just, you know, to give you an idea of what's going on or how it's gonna work. And me being able to translate legally into kind of, I guess, pop culture speak is, yeah. is what allows me to get you to understand what's actually happening and reassures you in your decision making. Because really, all I do is read something and I tell you, hey, you can do this, 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 or this, or that, um, you know, based off of my uh, experience. And then you get to make those choices, but you can't make those choices if you don't understand what I'm saying, you know? Yeah, yeah. See, that, that's definitely something that focuses me. I mean, that's even something I try to do, you know, when I talk about marketing a lot. Sometimes I'm taking some, some excuse. A lot of people know about marketing, but sometimes I'm taking some obscure concepts, you mm -hmm. know? that are coming from academia or business, some other industry, but I like to always try to flip it into be relatable so I can see how that, that helps because I know I don't be knowing what y'all be talking about, man. <laughs> I, I feel like I, it's so I can tell when I'm losing somebody, like I'll go off on a tangent and they're just like, get this glazed look on their eyes, like, I don't know. What <laughs> so then I'll kind of like bring it back and like, okay, if you do this, it effectively does it, or this means that this is what's going to happen, you know? Yeah. And usually that, that works out. And it's also, like I said, the references. Like, I use movies and TV shows because I'm a huge, like I said, I'm a huge 
just anything creative fans. So I love movies. I love TV and film. So um, all of my references are relatable. Well, career question, because you're in a position where, as you said, you get to work with people you like. You know, you, you're, you're owning your own business, so you don't have to work with people you don't like. However, you know, expanding past a certain level might cause you to work with people you don't like. But if I, so what does your career look like in the long term? Like, is it just continuing to do this? Maybe we just suggest with more people or on a higher level? I don't even know what the entertainment lawyer career path looks like, honestly. So. <laughs> Like, you know, Honestly, I, even... I am making my own way. So there's there's just the normal trajectories that people usually have. It's either you create your own firm, you partner with other people, y'all have a bigger firm, and then y'all start hiring as associates, and it becomes like a huge thing. Um, or you practice on your own and then take your clients to an established firm, go there, you know, something like that. Um, mm -hmm. Me personally, I feel like I'm gonna make money like this forever. I don't think it's gonna ever be a moment when um, I'm gonna, one, I don't want, I don't like any, what is that word? Authority, I don't like authority. I'm such an authority, anti-authority type of person. I literally went to law school to learn the rules so that you couldn't tell me anything. So it's like, you can't tell me what I can and cannot do because I know what the rules are and nothing that you're saying applies. So, you know, that's why I did, that's literally why I did it. And I told oh, my clients, you know, I'm an oh my gosh, I was an advocate. My, I used to get my little brother out of so much stuff just from trying to advocate on his behalf. It was not even a joke. He was my first client. I tell him that all the time. But um, I, uh, that's literally why I went to law school, for real. I was just like, I can't deal with anybody telling me what I can and cannot do, what time I need to come to the office or not. You know, like, just anything, anything that... I feel like none of that matters when it comes down to my work ethic. Yeah. I know what I'm doing. I do it very well. I understand it like the back of my hand. So regardless of whether I'm purple, pink, orange, black, or wearing a suit or, you know, a jumper, what does that even matter? Okay. Okay. But I will dress up to go to court. <laughs> and that's just because it's mandatory. We don't have a choice. Is it mandatory? It is mandatory for us to, to dress in certain in business casual or business attire in court. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. All, right. All right. So when it comes to artists, right? Have you do you ever you know all right, here's the first a good place to start actually. So I had an interview or I just know it was a conversation with a guy, right? And we were we were just talking about conflict of interest. Uh -huh. right? and he had a scenario where when he was younger he got signed to a label and then the CEO of the label asked to be his manager and then I was talking about a situation of when I just heard about I didn't know a, a particular situation someone was just telling me how they know situations where the manager's lawyer will try to become the artist's lawyer and things like that and just those areas of conflict that you how do you how do you feel about that space? Are there any scenarios where you feel like conflict of interest will be overrated, or how do you advise artists build their teams in, in that way? Got you. So conflicts of interest in entertainment are extremely it's extremely common. For example, I'll have an artist. Um, I'll be doing contract on the artist I have, but the manager is the one that actually contacted me. So I'm doing agreements for the manager, I'm doing agreements for the artist. Technically, I kind of represent them both, but you're not supposed to. That's pretty much how that works out. It's like, mm -hmm. um, but the cool thing about being a transactional attorney is that this applies to specific transactions. So that's why, that, that's how that, sorry, that's how there isn't a conflict of interest. So for example, if I'm doing the management contract for the manager and the artist, I let the artist know, hey, depending on who side I'm on, let's say that I'm on the manager side. So um, I'm doing a management agreement for the manager and the artist, right? I let the artist know, hey, I'm doing this agreement on the manager side. So you can go get somebody else to look at it on your behalf if you want to. I can explain it to you if you would like me to, but you have to understand that anything that I'm doing will be for the manager's benefit. Mm. Gotcha. Now, but now that same artist, right? So we get, you know, get the management agreement done, go get somebody else to look at it, they both sign it. 
So now the artist wants to, is going to get signed to a record label. The artist goes, hey, can you represent me on this? Definitely. Because that has nothing to do with the manager. That transaction is between the artist and the label. Does that make sense? Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. So, so now where it gets convoluted is like, for example, the manager gets a certain percentage from whatever, for whatever reason. Um, and, in the, and in that case, it's still not a conflict because I'm not negotiating any percentages. He's just going to get a percentage of whatever they already agreed on in the other agreement. Got it. Okay. So for you, it sounds like it's really just a matter of your personal integrity and how you carry yourself as an attorney, but it would really be an attorney to attorney basis. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's gotcha. literally a, well, the best way is to, to say it is on a transactional basis. So in this transaction, I can't represent both sides on one transaction. Got it. Okay. And you and always so, know whose side you're on. Correct. Now, the other side of conflicts of interest you're talking about is like if I'm an artist and I'm signed to a label, like I, I had an artist that was signed to Gucci's label, mm-hmm. 1019 or something like that. I don't remember, but uh, I don't remember right now. But um, he uh, he was pretty much in a management agreement with them, a publishing agreement with them, and a recording agreement with them. And so those incomes can cause issues in the contract because it'll be like they're getting 20 percent of this 30 percent here 50 percent here you know and yeah. so it's like where do the percentage like where do the percentages end or begin it get the thing get really convoluted but yeah. there are certain clauses that you know that are very common and that we use that pretty much we call it double dipping it prevents double dipping so uh, me representing the artist i'll go in and i'll be like hey you know you can manage him and you'll get your 20 percent of everything other than any other uh contract or any other thing that you do for him uh mm-hmm. as the label or as the publisher so if you're getting a percentage as the publisher then you can't get your manager's percentage if you're getting a percentage at the label then you can't get your man- manager's percentage you see what i'm saying and then vice versa okay got it and that's just literally a paragraph that we put into most of the contracts but you wouldn't know to argue that or ask for that unless you have an attorney. Mm, right. Because otherwise sense. it's allowed. <laughs> so you basically advise them, well, or maybe it goes without saying you shouldn't sign anything without an attorney. Right? Absolutely not. You don't know what you're looking at. But y'all unless also, you, uh, y'all are expensive, man. We are expensive. I think I'm pretty affordable. Uh, and that's just because it's, I feel like it's my duty. I don't know, I went to Park Atlanta and we have this huge W E B E W E how do you say it? W Du Bois. Du Bois. Du Bois. Yeah. Yeah. So um yeah, we were pretty much ingrained with that whole talented temp thing where it's mm-hmm. like, you know, you're one of few who's gotten the opportunity to get this far and you owe it to everybody else that looks mm-hmm. like you to try to educate them and lift them up. Like you know what I'm saying? Because not everybody gets the opportunity. So I try to spread it as far and as wide as I can without going bankrupt, to be honest. So, like, I'll work with you. Like, I'm going to try to work with you. If we take the L, I'm going to take the L. Like, I'll give you an example. Um, There's an agreement that I was negotiating. We were going back and forth over the percentages or whatever. Um, they ended up taking, they ended up getting less of an advance than they anticipated. So I charged them the, I charged them the difference, pretty much. Mm-hmm. I charged him, uh, I don't know how, else, I think I said that wrong. I didn't charge him the difference. <laughs> um, it's like, okay, so because they took less, I took less. Okay. So I was supposed to get a particular t- um, fee, but instead of me getting that fee, I was like, look, y'all took an L here, so I'm going to take the L with you. Right. You know? Mm-hmm. And, like, most attorneys aren't going to do that. They're just going to be like, well, give me my fee because I did my job, you know? <laughs> but um, I know what those, I know what those advances mean for uh, for us, you know? Those are opportunities for us. So it's like, I try my hardest not to be extra about it. And even if I did earn it, I try my best not to over, to, not to over, overly burden my client. Got you. That's, that's dope. Like, I, th- I mean, it's one of those reasons why, you know, I likely hear good things about you. And it's also, I mean, even that sit- goes back to that scenario, even where the guy chose you over the other attorney. Only- 
so little of you because I guess you you know you you project that you project that good energy. Why why is it so hard though? Do you feel like for artists to get over the hump? and to actually get in a tunnel? Because they don't see it as necessary at first. Uh, that's it? And, mm -hmm, that's literally it. It's like on their list of priority of things to do. You know, honestly, I'm not going to lie. Marketing and advertising needs to be at the top. But okay. regardless of that, it's like we should be in there too. We're on the same level of ne necessity. But most people don't see it that way. They see it like, what's the point of me having an attorney if I don't have nothing out yet? What's the, you know what I'm saying? Or something like that. And it's like, once you created it, you need an attorney because you created it. Now, what are you going to do with it? Are you going to log it to, you know, are you going to copyright it? Are you, are you sharing it with somebody? And if you are, then that's a transaction and there needs to be an agreement. Mm. Yeah. No, so all right, with agreements, and you mentioned uh, negotiations a few times, and especially when it comes to, you know, the guy who had the contract that inspired you to really take the entertainment industry seriously. What aspect do you take in negotiations? Like, are you actually, like if you're with an artist and this is your artist and you might be dealing with a label or whoever, are you actually doing the negotiations yourself? Like saying, hey, this number, we wanted this number, or do you allow the artist to, to do it and you just inform them on what's good or bad? That's a great question. It depends on the relationship. So. Um, if it's like a, hey, I don't know what's going on. They just told me that they want to use my song. Can you let, you know, can you, you know, talk to them for me? In that type of situation, I get all the control and I say, this is what we want. And y'all let me know if y'all are okay with that, <laughs> you know? But sometimes like um, a lot of artists, they have managers and their, manage, their manager will negotiate the percentage. And in that situation, it'll be like a, hey, this is what we discussed. Is this cool? You know, if you want to make any changes, let us know. But this is what these things specifically are already negotiated. And so in, the, in that sense, I don't negotiate any of the percentages or any of the um, things that they've previously agreed upon. I just will try to make the contract more on their side than it is at the mm -hmm. moment. So I might negotiate something and I'll send it over to you because I'm like, I'm good. This is what I want. But you might still look at it and say, you know, what, what about this? You still mm -hmm. might. Okay. Correct. Interesting. All right. All right. That's, that's encouraging because I feel like there's a lot of situations that, I mean, I, even I have encountered at times where, you know, I, as far as the negotiation part, I might be able to say some basic things as far as those few numbers that I know, like that main number. <laughs> But it might be the, the sign of print that you might not even know what you're giving up or not. Exactly. Yeah. And, and those are the usually things that I, uh, those are usually the things that I negotiate on my own every okay. single time, which is because you wouldn't even know that you could change it. But what I tell my clients is everything on that paper is negotiable. <laughs> yeah. I remember I have an uncle that he, he pretty much considers damn near everything in life negotiable. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, that sounds like me my kind of guy because i feel like everything is negotiable and there's an exception for everything so true all right so what what is one example of something that was small that you negotiated where previously they probably wasn't even thinking of negotiated just to kind of give artists an idea of what could be out there that they never think of okay so now because of how prevalent social media is for example, you know, artists have these crazy followings on social media. When they sign to a label, they give the label authority to, to post on those pages, to do all kinds of stuff on those pages through and for them. Um, but you want to retain that. You know, you want to retain control over it. You want to make, you want to retain certain, just, uh, just, no, that's literally it. You want to maintain control over it. And a lot of people don't know that you can literally put in the contract, hey, you know, even though you're allowed to do this, this, and this, at the end of the day, anything that you post on here is mine. When, when I leave you, I get full control of my account back. That's it. But most people don't even think to do that. Hmm. That's interesting. So, like, there are situations the where, like, a label might post on an account and say, hey, you can't take this down. Like, they, they do things all like kinds that. Of things. All kinds of controlling things, yes. <laughs> Also, 
what you guys wouldn't negotiate, wouldn't even know to negotiate is, for example, the accounting. And the accounting, because, um, you know, they're paying you a portion of whatever money, uh, which makes them accountable to do certain things for you or obligated to do certain things for you. So most of the time, the accounting will be like, you know, we'll, we'll pay you in like 90 days from that accounting period or 120 days from that accounting period. You can shorten those periods. And you can say, no, 30 days. You can say, no, we need to do this. And sometimes they go back and forth about it. And the only way that I'll give them anything more than 60 days is if um, it's in, if it's in their, uh, what is that thing? Uh, their operating agreement, or if they just let me know, hey, you know, this is how we account. We account semi-annually to everybody. And, you know, our business, is, our business tax or whatever is based off of this model. That's the only way that I'll allow them to do it. Mm. But then you have to explain it to me. I have to understand why. You have to say, show me some documents. Let me see mm-hmm. some. Show me something or tell me something that's going to give me a, that will assure my client as to why you, they have to wait 90 days to get paid. So. Got you. Yeah, I definitely know. I've known some people that it's stupid long before they get paid. I see that mostly in like, um, I represent a lot of DJs um, uh, and a lot of artists when it comes to like shows and venue, like with the venue and stuff like that. And they'll have like these crazy accounting times. And, you know, those are such short two, three page agreements that you don't even think about it. You're just signing it to get your cash. Yeah. But then they're like, oh, we got a 60 day net or a 90 day net. And you're like, I already performed. You know what I'm saying? It's like, no, pay me as soon as I sign this contract. That's it. Sheesh. Yeah, I, n- I never heard of that. I didn't realize people were doing that with shows. I thought All shows, were, if anything, they would move faster than. <laughs> no. Huh. Not at all. The finesse is everywhere. The finesse <laughs> is real. All right. So, hey, where were you? Where are you from, by the way? I'm from Brooklyn, New York. What made you come come to Atlanta? School. Just for college. Yeah, I watched. Um, what was that? What was that? It was like a college tour or something on BET. College Hill. College. No, it was a black college tour. Oh, they I remember filmed that. It and they put it on BET, and I was like. Oh, oh, I'm out of here. I'm going to that school. And I went. Yo, that's dope. See, that makes me think immediately that they need to bring that back then. Apparently, Absolutely. it has. Dang. Mm-hmm. It inspired me to go to HBCU. Absolutely. <laughs> that's funny. Well, which part was it? Was it, was it the fact that it looked lit or? Yes. I'm not even going <laughs> to lie to you. It was like, oh, I can have fun and do work too. Because I was already a good student. It was never about schoolwork for me. It was always just about, who can I talk to? What's going to happen? How, what relationships can I build? Mm, got you. Now, before, while I think about it, I don't know if it really popped in my head, but I'm glad it did. So, like, for an entertainment lawyer, like someone mm-hmm. who wants to be who you are, how, how do you get those first clients when we talk about those real clients? Because, of course, you can always be running up to a, a lot of these random artists who say they want to rap or whatever that is. But first of all, a lot of them aren't ready. They don't even want somebody that early. Like, so how do you really, how'd you break into becoming an official, I don't want to say official. No, I understand. We, we a, like lot of people, a lot of people say career. that they're entertainment attorneys and it's like, no, they actually practice personal injury and they do this on the side. All kinds of crazy yeah. stuff. So yeah, I yeah. know what you mean by actual. So with me, I was very strategic. Um, I knew that I wanted to be in it, but I had no time. So what I did, I don't know if it's going to work for everybody else, but what I did was I started just volunteering for music festivals. I would go on the festival website, see when I could apply to volunteer, and I would apply to volunteer every single year, all the time. Whichever ones that I could drive to, go to, however I was going. Um, I met a lot of people, and a lot of the relationships that I built, those people became my clients. Or those people, like, once they got to a certain level, it's like, we kind of rose together. Because it was like, mm-hmm. I was in law school when I was doing this stuff. So we kind of rose together. They were doing their things as event planners and um, show show creators and stuff like that. And I was in law school. And by the time I got out, we were, like, here. And it was like, oh, hey. <laughs> and it just worked out. And it just worked out like that. Um, I will also say that uh, internships are pivotal. Internships and mentorships. I literally um, annoyed the crap out of my mentor, and so she gave me an opportunity. I took her to lunch. I talked to her. I emailed her. I would just 
send her stuff like, hey, I'm doing this. Did you know this? Or hey, or um, what I like to do because I had a background in journalism is I would do write up. Be like, hey, you should use this for your bio. Hey, it's trying to get in, in it's on her team and mm-hmm. in her in her mind. So by the time she was like, oh, I want to intern, I was the first person that she thought about. Right, makes sense. So really, the two things I'm hearing for when you start building your relationships early, like straight up, and then also like that persistence. Pleasant persistence, I imagine. Pleasant persistence, don't be annoying. Because once you're annoying, they're gonna avoid you. You have to be, it's like make yourself, make yourself useful. I found a way by doing things that nobody else wanted to do. Like she was like, she was complaining about her file system. So I went and created a new file system for her, which was tedious and annoying for me to do, but it's a system she still uses to this day, you know? Oh, uh, the small stuff. All right. Small stuff, man. Cool. So I want to like end with like the one more question about that career thing. Cause I want, like you said, you'll, you'll be doing this type of thing forever. Well, as far as you think you can make money this way forever. Mm-hmm. But so I'm imagining, okay, yeah, you don't want to have other attorneys or anything like that under you, but do you have some kind of space where, I mean, you know, you keep bringing in good clients like you are, you're going to accumulate a decent amount of money over time, obviously. So is there something, another field that you want to get into one day? You want to start your own, I don't know, beauty brand or real estate or what's that look like? No, I'm sticking to, I'm sticking to this, but what I'm going to do, well, this is what I have in the work so far. And uh, yeah, you tell me how you feel about it actually. Um, So I'm going to create pretty much this, a downloadable PDF that okay. lists out what you need to do. Like it's pretty much going to be a step by step, step by step instructions, and it is also going to include a um, a six month or two quarter plan. And it's just like if you're an indie artist, songwriter, producer, I'm going to have different ones for different one for different for the different uh, type. And it's going to mm-hmm. lay out everything that you need because what I'm starting. I'm at the point where I get annoyed when I have to double back and do work that you should have been doing on your own if this is what you want to do. And that's like logging your music and logging the percentages, you know, and who owns what and, you know, like um, signing yourself up to a PRO and, you know, like, yeah, signing yourself up to sound exchange. It's like, I shouldn't have to retroactively do this for you. When you come to me, this should already be done because now I'm helping you with these transactions with these people that are trying to pay you. And now I have to go back and create your LLC. I got to go back and create your, uh, your ASCAP account. I got to go back and do all this stuff. Whereas, you know what I'm saying? If you already have this together, it makes my life so much easier. And of course I charge you for it. So you want me to do all of this on top of negotiate your deal for you. I'm going to charge you for that. Whereas Mm -hmm. I can give you this, I can give you this step-by-step, um, pretty much plan that has everything in it that you need for like, half of the price that I would charge for an hour, <laughs> you know, and you can already have all that stuff by the time you come to me. I think you should definitely do that. Like that's, yeah, that's easy. For one, that's how I, I create like a lot of stuff that I've done, honestly, it just cause like you said, like you don't want to have to double back and do things that they could do themselves. But like what you're doing, especially in that space, because there's so much question around it. I mean, you, you could, like that's almost something like before I know I do a consultation with you or something like that, depending Absolutely. on what I Absolutely. It's like if you come to me and you haven't already done that, then I'm not yeah. talking to you. Exactly. And it's a, it's a prerequisite. So, mm-hmm. no, you, you got to do that. All you, right. Let me, know, <laughs> let me know when you do it because I will make it known. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm done. I'm working on it. Right now, I have um, Guard Your Gifts, which is pretty much an Instagram account that um because i scour the internet all the time just for relevant information and just because i know that there's so much information out there y'all don't really know which one's what's good and what's not so on guard your gifts i'm pretty much posting stuff that i find on the internet that's actually correct so like you can literally so you can literally go look at it bookmark it you know save it so that you can go back to it whatever because you know from your instagram account and that's just me building up the content or whatever that I'm going to use for these uh, for these plans that I'm going to create. Okay. Yeah. I'm about to go ahead and 
follow that right now because I think I just, <laughs> I just saw that um, when I was on your profile. All right, but um, okay. and so like daily, every day, I'm gonna post one thing that I find on the internet that's actually accurate. Actually, yeah. that part I always wonder because especially when it comes to what y'all y'all do, but there. Like how many people get There's caught so up? There's so much misinformation. Information, yes. So I, much misinformation. Even with marketing, people come to me doing things. I'm like, ah, uh, you know, but I, I don't want to take any shot at whoever you got the information from. But from my experience, oh no, I do, I do that. I'm just like, who did you hear that from? It's wrong. <laughs> you can tell them I said it's wrong, and if they have a problem with it, tell them to call me. Because <laughs> I'm gonna uh, tell them to their face, you're dumb, and this is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> all right fair all enough right, the new york came out <laughs> the new yorker came out. yeah y'all don't lose that y'all don't lose that <laughs> my dad's from uh new jersey and oh yeah what is he here he's been, he been here more than uh, like in atlanta more of his life than he's been in new york and yeah it doesn't matter it never goes away it don't matter man y'all there's something wrong with y'all just a little bit <laughs> I mean, hey, you need the pit bulls sometimes. You need to pull out the shark when people are, are playing crazy, you know? And that part is real. For. That part is real. <laughs> okay, well, hey, I appreciate you once again. And just so everybody knows, of course, I'm going to put all of Matera's information at the bottom, on the screen, all that good stuff. But what is the best place, like, just one place that you would like people to go to if you already have something for them to look out for? Please hit me up on Instagram. I am addicted to Instagram. I'm like addicted. It's a problem. So I answer my DMs. I answer questions that I can answer under a minute. So if it takes me longer than a minute to answer it, then you have to pay me. <laughs> Ooh, and that's, that's on a, That's like via DM. I'm, so glad like you, the, I'm glad you said that. People need to hear that. Say it yeah. one more time. Under a minute. So if it's something that I can type out in 150 characters or less, cool, I'll send it to you. I'll try to, you know, get as in-depth as I can in a DM, you know. But um, other than that, yeah, that's the best way to hit me. If not, then atira at guardsofgifts.com. Shoot me an email. Let me go from there. Got it. All right. Y'all heard it from her. I would love to know what you guys think of this interview right here. Um, definitely hit her up. She is a valid source. That's one of the reasons she's here. I know you guys are getting finessed or wondering if you are getting finessed. This source will not do such. So um, if you like this video, go ahead and hit the like button. If you like it, you might as well share it. And if you're not subscribed, you know what to do. Hit that subscribe.